Likewise, we can plot that the growth in our re renal replacement therapy is really in the elderly. The large green peak is those aged over 65. And despite popular concern, actually diabetes, which is in the red bar, has not grown anywhere near as much as it has in the UK or in the USA, Japan, Taiwan, a few other countries which have very high rates of diabetic kidney disease. And I would congratulate my GP colleagues, Jerry and others in the, in the, in the audience, because I think it's uh, our very good diabetes care uh, in the community and increasingly everywhere else that is contributing to this. We use what is called a funnel plot to interpret differences between units so that you can see that survival in this particular unit over here and the bottom here is much lower below the solid red line. Uh, this is Cardiff, it's identifiable in the report and Cardiff went off with this information and did a <coughs> thorough review of their mortality, 130 odd patients who died that year in Cardiff involved with renal replacement and found that really they just had very sick patients. Cardiff uh, covers Merthyr Tydfil, the most, one of the most deprived areas in the UK for instance. So this is, uh, an, uh, we were able to explore that this is clearly because of deprivation and case mix. The following year, Cardiff's mortality is actually back in the middle of the, of the, the group again. We can answer specific audit questions about standards that we have set. So an audit should answer a standard question. So what percentage of your patients have a blood pressure less than 140 over 90? And we can answer this. Um, we can now do it quite nicely using a map system. And you can go in and, and hit the uh, focus on Belfast. I've highlighted Belfast here. And you can see that we were only achieving 38.6% of our patients getting that standard. Um, not great across the UK, but certainly we could do better. And we haven't improved over the last three or four years. So I've got some work to do when I go back today to say, right, well, what can we do better? One of the simple things you can do with this is you can look at your neighboring unit, Tyrone County, is achieving nearly twice the rate of blood pressure improvement compared to our unit. So I can pick up the phone, ring Peter Garrett and others and say, what are you doing differently than, from us? Okay, so the map is very dynamic. It allows us to see that actually Tyrone is right at the top of the achievement ladder. In the UK terms, Belfast is stuck in the sort of second from bottom uh, quartile. But this is, this is very helpful to help uh, people drive forward quality and improvement. We can also obviously publish academic papers, but this is, uh, this is just published in the BMJ, highlighting that there's a lot of variation. Just look at the scatter around the percentage uh, in the numbers of patients that are registered for transplantation within two years. And if you're a dialysis patient in one of these units at the bottom, and you say, well, hold on a minute, I don't want, I don't, I'm down here, there's only 30% of myself, my colleagues are listed for transplant, we want to be up here, we want to have 60% of our patients listed, assuming that we've got the case mix adjustment right. So this is a very big driver for change. The other important simple practical steps, when people say to you, oh, Mr. or Mrs. Bloggs, she's too old really to go on dialysis. Well, you can use these figures to inform your practice. Say, well, actually, we know that if you're over 75, that you've got, on average, five years of life left. That's far better than many other chronic diseases. So you get end-stage renal failure, you will live for five years, on average, in those who are over 75 in the UK. So, we're not perfect. We have lots of gaps in the data, so we've got these areas that we would like to improve on. We would like to, new areas to consider, hospitalization, quality of life, patient reported outcomes. These are all of the things that we want to move into. And we're very uh, bad at recording palliative care, conservative care pathways. So I'm interested to hear what Kieran and others have to say later about this. One of the things we've developed from this system is the patients now can view their own records. It's called renal patient view. And there are about 14,000 patients in the UK registered that go in and look at their lab records, their drugs, and so on. And we've now started piloting a system whereby they can go in and put in their blood pressure. So if you find it an item difficult to capture, well, why not ask the patient to do it? So patients are doing this electronically. It won't be for everybody, clearly. 
but it will certainly work for many patients and their family who've got, who've got access to the computer and the internet. So this has been a great success. Many of our patients come along with the results in hand now. Just going to move into a few of the other national audits before I finish. This is one of the largest that is funded by uh, HQIP. It's called Minot Myocardial Ischemia National Audit Project. And you can see dramatic changes across England and Wales. This is this does not include Northern Ireland data. So I don't know what Northern Ireland is doing. I'm sure cardiologists will tell us that, that they're very similar to this. I think they are from my, my speaking with them. But you can see that the majority of people now get primary angioplasty. So those of us who used to run around the country in cardiac ambulances given thrombolysis, that's a very much a dying area now. And primary thrombolysis is the, is the main uh, treatment mode. This is the percentage of patients with an emission diagnosis who've had primary angioplasty. It's growing each year uh, up to nearly 90%. And most importantly, the survival is improving year on year. So that in the last year, just over 8% top left a top right of patients who had a, a ST elevation myocardial infarction survived the first nine months. So really this is a staggering change in my lifetime as a doctor to see this improvement in uh, myocardial and, and other areas uh, done through national registries and audits. We're working closely with uh, the National Diabetes Audit and again I highlight this because it's got England and Wales in there and we are not on the map. We are off the map here. I don't know why I would like to be compared with my other units as I am in the renal world, but in the diabetes world, I would like to be compared with the rest of the UK, since we have roughly similar structures. Or at least to have enough uh, resource that we can say, yes, we can put them side by side, and we're equivalent. There are issues for us specific to Northern Ireland, and there are issues in that we, we have the Data Protection Act that applies to the whole of the UK, but in the rest of uh, in the England and Wales, and we'll hear a little bit about Scotland, uh, they have a, a way to, if you like, have a central body that can give them, uh, if you like, um, uh, a governance arrangement to say they're allowed to, act, to use non-anonymised data to do national audit. And this is the, the Health and Social Care Act 2006, what's called Section 251. I don't want to get too technical. But they, they apply to a central body, it's mentioned at the bottom, the National Information Governance Board that they have in the England and Wales. We do not have the equivalent in Northern Ireland. I know we're working towards it, and I've spoken to Chris Matthews and others in the department, we're working towards this. But in my view, we are very much behind until we get this. And many of my colleagues, when they go to do this, feel, um, I feel like, get frustrated by the bounds that are set there because everybody's uncertain about the the data protection issues and the confidentiality issues. But I think these are surmountable. So what can we do now while we're waiting for this? Well, you can still go to the various data custodians. I've done this for a chronic kidney disease register that I'm involved with. Uh, we can still have our projects at MER national audits. We can certainly consider how we use our audit resources. So one of the questions I would pose to you as leaders of audit, should local audit map or inform some of the regional and national audits. Should we fund an audit that is a standalone thing that's going to be done once? I'll leave that up for you, for you to decide, but I, I think I've shown you what my view is anyway. We should consider the sustainability of audit in this day of economic hardship. Do you want your staff going around with pens and papers doing it once, or would you like an electronic system to do it every year? The efficient systems then are required. We need to use the existing systems. We have to get away from the Belfast Trust system and many other trusts. We've got 500 different clinical information systems. It's unbelievable. And we have to understand the importance of unique identifiers, linkage between these systems to allow us to answer these questions. And at the very bottom, I'm just getting to the idea that we need to be more sophisticated. It's not just good enough to do the audit. You have to understand what are the resources available for, for achieving that audit. So that's what, what I would term multi-level audit, where you actually audit the staff resources as well as the patient outcomes and say, well, actually, that unit's very efficient. So this is what we have to move into. So I'll finish there by saying, what can I do in my area to help? 
sustain an audit, get involved with IT. Even if the system does crash, get kept, keep involved with your IT people uh, and keep doing the audits. Thank you for your attention. We have, yeah, I didn't go, I just showed you one standard about the blood pressure standard, so I didn't go into the various standards. We have a couple of hundred standards across the various areas that we cover in terms of outpatients or transplants. We don't have a standard on the proportion of elderly, but, you know, and you raise a very good point. I mean, I, I've been saying this, obviously, um, and perhaps we should have a standard, because clearly there are some regions that, that uh, you know, and, and there is also inappropriate dialysis in some people who don't survive. I mean, so that comes sort of on the next part is, you know, the registry can kind of affect outcomes or has it, is it moving into this? Well, really yeah, we've talked about this. We've talked about whether a central registry can actually affect change in outcomes. And I, I, my view is quite clear. What we can do is gather data, present it back to people, help them understand it, because that's important. It's not as simple as you think. You need to adjust for ages and case mix, as we've, we've seen. But you then have to leave the change to the individual unit. That's my personal view, because they, they are the people that know the resources. But they need to see themselves on that map each year to see where they rank. And that drives thing. I mean, I, I perhaps didn't show, but our survival is going up every year. Now, you could say, well, survival is going up every year in the general population. But our survival is going up slightly more than we would anticipate just from, from if you like, the background population. So there are things that we are seeing year on year. and. I don't think it's for us to tell people how to do that change because that would require us to move into actually obtaining unit level information and then presenting that back. We might get into there, but that, will, that would double our resource. I think we'd have to, you know, at the minute we have a budget of about a million to do this. I think we'd have to double it to really get into that area. The qualitative work, which is, I think, we're, what you're talking about, and qualitative work is very important, but you, you find that often happens at unit level. Thank you very much, Damien. Uh, again, on your behalf, I want to thank Damien for a very salutary talk on the